Okay. So um, I'm just going to do our little introduction here. So thank you for attending the Virtual Inspiring Abilities Expo. My name is Tamara Houchins. I'm a FUSE board member. Um, I would like just like to go over a couple of housekeeping items before we begin. Um, this session is being recorded and will be accessible on the FUSE website. Um, also, it'll be available in the app for, I think, six months, but then we're, we'll continue to post it on our website. So, so please consider that when asking or, or sharing, or asking any questions. Um, so that it depends on how personal you want to be for everyone to, to hear. Um, I will ask that you remain muted unless asking a question. You will also have accessibility to the chat room or the chat area, and I'll, I will monitor that. Um, so pr please feel free to use that and ask any questions there. Um, and I will let our speaker know of any pop-ups or questions um, that come up there. And I'm excited to welcome you to this afternoon's session on Centers for Independent Living 101 presented by Tracy Taylor. Tracy Taylor is the Director of Independent Living Services at the Independent Living Center of Eastern Indiana. Uh, for the past eight years, she has been a disability advocate for over 40 years doing advocacy work in California and <laughs> Indiana. So please help me welcome Tracy. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for joining and thank you, Tamara, for the, the wonderful intro. Um, I'm excited and, and honored to be here with all of you and am, am glad to be able to um, uh, have this session. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and go over some general uh, information about the Independent Living Center and the Independent Living Center movement, the Independent Living Movement, excuse me. Um, and then I'm going to get into a little bit of the specifics for our center, um, the specific services that we can provide, because they do vary from center to center just a little bit, and our coverage areas. And then we can, we can go ahead and talk about any questions or concerns that you may have individually. Once again, as Tamara mentioned, um, this is being recorded, so just kind of be aware of how much you would like to share um and what you're comfortable with kind of having living out there in the internet world so um let me see is my my screen share is on right Tamara? yeah okay great all righty well like we already mentioned um my name is tracy and i am the director of independent living services here at the independent living center of eastern indiana and we are going to go ahead and get started with Independent Living Centers 101. This is kind of a basic overview. And um, so the beginning of the independent living movement really basically mirrors the civil rights movements of the 50s and 60s. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and during the 50s and 60s was when a lot of the general civil rights for um, individuals of color was going, was occurring and beginning and starting to really pick up um, some momentum. So we, we sort of, we as in the disability community, um, sort of hitched on to that as another mar marginalized population. So we really got up and started with the name, with the general, excuse me, with the gentleman by the name of Ed Roberts. He's considered the father of the independent living movement. And at the age of 14, Mr. Roberts um, contracted polio, which uh, basically um, left him uh, uh, as an individual with quadriplegia meaning he did not have any, um, any sensation or significant movement below the neck. So his lungs were involved, his limbs were involved, and his body below the neck um, was compromised. 
but he was significantly accomplished in school and he applied to the University of California at Berkeley in 1962 and he was admitted. Everything at that time, of course, was on paper and his grades were immaculate and his, his referrals were great and all of his extracurriculars were incredible. So University of California Berkeley said, yes, we want you on our campus. Come on over, we want you in our student body. So Mr. Roberts showed up that day in the fall of 1962 in his powered wheelchair with his iron lung behind him and said, great, I'm ready, where are the dorms? I wanna move in. And the folks at University of California Berkeley kind of went, whoa, wait a minute. We were, were we, we have steps, our doorways are narrow. You have medical needs and we're, we're not, we, no, 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 this, this isn't going to work. It's not the best for you. You need somewhere where you can be safer and you can be taken care of and you, you don't need to be at school. And Mr. Roberts said, no, 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 no. <laughs> you admitted me. I've worked hard to get here. I'm going to school here. And you, you've already said yes, so where should I go? So um, they, they directed him to an unused wing of the hospital that was on campus um, because California University Berkeley did have a medical school. So they had a hospital attached to the, to the campus. So they, they directed him there because the rooms were big enough to accommodate his needs and to all of his medical equipment. And they felt the staff there was more, um, uh, more well-trained to take care of his needs. So he, he was like, well, you know, okay, I'll go there. Um, and as he was there, he had a, a 10 o'clock requirement to be back in his room because that was when staff changed and staff needed to be able to tell other staff what had been happening. And he also didn't have access to, you know, the, the football games and the, the frat and sorority stuff, all the typical college type things. And so he, you know, he, he was sort of okay in the beginning. And then as it went through, he kind of thought, you know, I'm not really getting the college experience here and I deserve the right to the college experience. I, I, I've been admitted to the university. I've paid my dues both literally and figuratively. And I have the right to be a, a full-fledged student and receive all of the, the extracurricular activities and all of the rights and enjoyments that my fellow students um, have the, are, are enjoying. So they, they started figuring out ways that, that he could attend football games um, more on like the field level. So he didn't have to you know, go up into the stands where there's steps, there are obviously a barrier um, and, and other things. And as we all know, because we're all in this together, word of mouth in the disability community is wildfire. <laughs> so, it started getting out that Ed Roberts was going to University of California, Berkeley. He had a significant disability. He was a wheelchair user, an iron lung user, and he was in college there and he was getting stuff done and getting stuff changed. So other individuals who were chair users um, who had significant disabilities were like, hey, I wanna go to University of California, Berkeley because this guy's doing it and I wanna do it too. So, there was a huge influx, which maybe 20 to 30 people with disabilities, which is a huge influx during the early 60s <laughs> um, onto a university campus. Um, they all kind of came and said, hey, we, we want to be with this guy. And um, so they kind of all got together and uh, they became affectionately, they, they dubbed themselves the rolling quads, because they all were individuals with quadriplegia. And so they kind of moved around the campus, not really in a pack, but, you know, kind of kind of like in a little pack. Um, and so everybody on campus, both their peers with disabilities and their peers without disabilities, 
started to kind of know them because you kind of notice like 10 or 12 wheelchair users kind of going around the campus, you know? So they, they, you know, they started interacting with each other and they were like, hey, you know, this is, this is really kind of cool. We all should be doing this together. Why, why weren't wheelchair users here before? So Ed Roberts um, got his uh, bachelor's degree in political science in 1964 and got his master's in 1966. And he went on to become a senator, excuse me, a congressman for California and went on into a, a political career. And he was really the, the American shift in the par paradigm, par I can't say that word, shift for the medical model becoming the independent living model. And the independent living model is consumer directed. The individuals with the disabilities drive the bus, if you will. Um, they, they lead their own, um, they direct their own services. In the past, before, before Ed Roberts um, got into this realm, uh, it had been more medical and in mo a medical model. And that was, that's more like the doctors know more than you and they know what's right and what's not right and what's good for you and not good for you. So it was very parental. And Ed Roberts and the folks in his group were like, no, 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 I'm an adult. I, I know what I need. And this also brings along the, the dignity of, of um, the ask, you know, ask before you do, and the, uh, the right to fail, the, you know, the dignity of failure. Whereas an individual with a disability has every right to succeed and or fail just as much as individuals without disabilities do. So those are kind of part of the key shifts to the independent living movement. Now in 1973, with the passage of the Rehabilitation Act, um, the federal government started or created funding for each state to have an independent living center, which is what ILC stands for. Um, most states have more than one, Indiana actually has 10. And so um, we, we cover a majority of the state. Um, feel free, we, we can talk about what centers would serve your areas. Um, and like I mentioned, I'll talk about what areas our center serves, um, but I can let you know what, what your, uh, what your count, where your county would be served. So speaking of those services, the independent living centers have five core services that we are required to serve and, or provide. The first one is advocacy. And this is both self-advocacy, assisting individuals and in advocating for their own needs and their own desires, and systemic advocacy, which is helping to change the systems, the governments, the, the general community settings um, in order to be more accommodating for folks with disabilities, whether it be helping to um, create systemic change for curb cuts, for um, braille signage, for better understanding um, in terms of usage in wording, such as like not using the R word, things of that nature. Those are all examples of systemic advocacy. We also provide peer support and um, all of our centers are required to have over half the staff and board must be individuals with disabilities because we, we really want or, or the movement really wants or is centered on the fact that individuals with disabilities need to be in control of, of where we're going. and. So it would be a little bit silly for us to say that the consumers are in control if the people that are in control of the services and funding were not individuals with disabilities. So we feel that individuals with disabilities and a broad, broad spectrum of disabilities and multiple disabilities are definitely included, that we sort of all understand each other a little bit better. Excuse me, we can also speak from from um, an area of experience. 
And a lot of times people will come in. I'm an individual who uses crutches and I use hand controls on my car. And so we will get phone calls from individuals who are, you know, wanting to learn how to drive or need a vehicle modified. And I can explain not only the logistics of it, you know, who can provide the accommodation, who, what mechanic can install the hand controls, those sort of things, but also the little nuances that are like, you know, when you're first learning it, start out in a parking lot and just stop and start because you need to know how much, you know, how hard to push with the hand controls and things of that nature. Whereas if an individual uses gas pedals, they may not know that information. So we, we also have life experience that we can, we can put in there. Um, of course, one of our core skills is independent, excuse me, core services is independent living skills. That's why we're here. Um, and those are teaching skills to live as independently as one wishes. And those can be anything um, from cooking and cleaning with a disability to budgeting, to transportation access, to finding an apartment that's accessible, to helping with employment, um, pre-employment, uh, education services, all of the above fall under independent living skills. Um, information and referral is another big one that we do a lot of. We provide a lot of services but there are some services that we don't provide or that other programs in your area may be able to provide more effectively or efficiently for you. So we can also provide, we can also act as a liaison and or an interpreter for those other programs and services. For example, one of the things we can do is we can assist with IEP case conferences and 504 case conferences. Um, and we can kind of be, at the table for those. We can also help to interpret um, the, the, the lingo and all of the 20 million acronyms out there in the world. So we can help um, interpret for you and interpret back to the, the program um, if, if the parents or families have a specific question or concern, we can help them verbalize that too. And of course, transition. And um, we have two main, main aspects of transition. One of them is transitioning people out of hospitals or care facilities, nursing care homes, um, group home facilities uh, in a way that's safe and effective for the individual. And the second one is transitioning into adult life. And I know that we had a question on what adult life is. Um, or transitioning after. And it, it's hard to explain because adult life is whatever adult life is for that individual. Um, uh, the independent living movement, as I said, is very specific to the individual. The individual is in charge. So whatever their after secondary, after, excuse me, after high school looks like, whether it's post-secondary education, college, trade school, training, um, whether it's employment, whether it's um, supported living arrangements, whether it's supported working arrangements, whatever that transition looks like is dependent upon what the individual wants as their goal. So it's hard to say what, it's hard to, to, to specifically state this is transition because transition looks different to everybody. A lot of times, especially in the medical model, if you have a specific disability, I, I'm just gonna pick CP out of the air, cerebral palsy. Um, an individual, a medical model would say, okay, you're an individual, you have this diagnosis. That means you get this, this, and this services. These are what you need these five things or 10 things or whatever is what you get. We actually work the opposite. Um, we say, you know what, we need to know your diagnosis for paperwork, but it doesn't really matter to us what your diagnosis is. 
What is the impact of your diagnosis? What areas are you having difficulty in working through? And then we can help you work through those. So just because you have the same disability, you may have totally different needs because as we all know, disabilities impact everybody differently. So your transition needs may and very well be, be different from person to person as well. So um, as was mentioned, I'm going to mention a little bit more about what services the Independent Living Center of Eastern Indiana or ILSEN can provide for our folks in our catchment area. And this is our service area. We serve Wayne Henry Rush Decatur Fayette Union Franklin and then we have some low vision services we partner with another independent living center down south from us and um, they serve Jennings Ripley Dearborn Ohio Switzerland and actually you know what they just updated to Scott County so Scott should be um, in that map I apologize I just realized that this was not a not a, a this was a map that does not have Scott in there. Um, but so those are our specific service areas. Like I said, we do have 10 centers in the state. Um, and if you're interested in who serves your county, we can definitely go ahead and to let you know who that is and some contact information. Um, feel free to put that in chat if you would like to know and your specific county, or you can ask it in the session Q&A afterwards. So what our center can do to help you and your family is, as I mentioned, we can help support you at case conferences at IEP case conferences in 504. We can also help with pre-employment skills, soft skills such as just, you know, being on time, um, how to dress appropriately, how to make sure that you're you're interacting with your coworkers appropriately and your bosses or supervisors, those sort of things. We can help with interviewing skills. We can help with resume building um, and a variety of other um, skills in terms of pre-employment. We can also provide assistive products um, and uh, things such as, but not limited to, transfer benches, utensil holding straps, rollators, reachers, grabbers, those sorts of things. Not an exhaustive list by any means. Um, and once again, we can, we can tailor these to the specific need of the individual. Um, we can also provide, a, provide general family support, which is kind of like just sort of a wraparound service, sort of. Um, we can be an understanding ear and a knowledgeable mind to help talk about questions or concerns. We, we know, uh, on our staff, we're either individuals with disabilities or have family members with disabilities, so we get it. Um, in fact, we were talking a little bit before this started about how, you know, those of us in the disability realm are kind of up at all hours of the night, <laughs> depending on how or when disability impacts kind of come running into your life. Um, you know, sometimes three o'clock in the morning, you have a little one that is having a, a disability related concern or maybe just a little one related concern, or you yourself may be having a disability related kind of night and, you know, it just, it happens and, and we get it, we totally get it. Um, we also we we understand how it can be for parents um, to to talk about their their children um, growing up and aging out of some of the services. We understand that as well. You know what happens when my son Johnny gets you know gets out of school what is there? He's for the past 12, 14 years had pre-K, K, K through 12 services that have kicked in for his support needs. And now when he graduates, he's not going to have those. So those are some scary thoughts and, um, and things uh, and concerns. So we, we get those. Um, and also, as I alluded to before, we can also be a connection to other programs who can provide 
greater or more services and programs that may meet the needs that you have or may mean the needs that you have in your areas such as but not limited to um, vocational rehab connections we can connect with those folks we can help you connect with beads the bureau of the bureau of developmental disability services we can help with family social family and i cannot speak today family and social services administration needs um medicare medicaid connections uh, social security, disability, social security, or SSI, SSDI needs. Um, we can help with all of those as well. Um, we don't provide direct support with that, but we can help you connect with the programs who do. Um, so ultimately we are here to empower people with disabilities and to help support them to live as independently as they would like both themselves and their families here's our contact information feel free to go ahead and give us a call follow us on facebook and or youtube um and uh you can email me uh at, at the email on the screen and um i also have all this at our vendor um in our little vendor box. Uh, so all the contact information is there as well. And like I said, we may not serve your particular county, but we can help you connect with whomever does. So at this point, um, like to maybe open it up to questions. I saw the, the little chat box kind of pop it up a little bit. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Um, let's see. Let me go down to chat. Okay. Um, centers in Hancock County. Alrighty. Hold on one sec while I look at my map. Um, Hancock. Alrighty. And actually, the center for Hancock County, Hamilton, and Marion, but all of those little guys are all um, connected to accessibility, which is based in Indianapolis. And um, I believe that they actually have a vendor booth here. Um, so let me, uh, I will go ahead and type in um, their information. Let me get their phone number. Oh, you know what? Um, Sam, my coworker, Samantha, uh, actually, could you type in, Sam, do you have their updated phone number? They just moved recently. <laughs> um, so uh, they're, I, you know what? Let me give you their number because I think it's probably the same. Okay, the number that we have, you know what, I'm gonna give you the toll free number because that probably has not changed. Um, oh, you got it? Okay, thank you. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Didn't mean to be yelling back and forth. <laughs> um, fabulous. Good, good, good. Thank you so much, Kathy. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, alrighty. Uh, so let's see, Marianne Hancock. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Tamara. You guys are on it. Thank you, thank you. Um, what services are covered by insurance and waivers? Good question. Uh, and I know that that you, you, you don't want to hear this answer, but it really depends on what insurance you have and what waivers you have. Um, things like the traumatic brain injury waiver is going to cover different services than things like the aged and disability waiver or A&D waiver. Um, I think those are two of the more common waivers 
There also is a waiver for individuals, um, for services with individuals with autism, and that covers some specifics. So it kind of really depends on what waiver you have. Um, things in terms of insurance, um, Medicare and Medicaid can cover um, uh, basic um, general general services as well as items such as um, bedside commodes, um, hospital bed rentals, uh, mobility devices, um, and things of that nature. And um, it's probably going to be your best bet to speak with your case manager for your insurance to find out specifics on whether something is covered or not. Um, you know, if someone needs a a power chair versus a a cane, and they recently got a cane a couple years ago, when will they be eligible for a power chair? Things of that nature are going to be kind of specific. So I hate to give you a, a broad answer, um, but it really depends on. Uh, the type of insurance and or waiver that you have um, and the need. My best suggestion is to, if you have an insurance need, talk with your physician about it and then talk with their billing department because the, ins the physician's billing department knows the insurance way better than I do. <laughs> Um, every time I get information about the insurance um, changes, I, I absorb it and I learn it. And then when I go to apply it, it's changed already. So that stuff is like a living entity that changes almost, it seems like from month to month. So the people that deal with insurance billing are going to know the most updated information on it. Any other questions or comments, concerns? Anything anybody would like to talk about? No? Okay. Stacey, <laughs> um, actually, I would I would like to talk yes. to you for a second. Um, I have um, an adult brother, um, almost 40, who um, we are trying to figure out a way for him to live independently. As, uh -huh. as of right now, he is living with my mom. Um, okay. He is on Medicaid, but and um, but does not have any waiver services um, and has been kicked off of Social Security. Um, okay. What what kind of services would you be able to provide my family in helping him transition from living at home to being an independent adult? Sure. Sure. Um. First thing we would probably do is kind of go over the activities of daily living to see what areas that he is strong in and what areas that he could use some support in. So if shopping and budgeting are fine, but cooking is, is a need, then we would go ahead and focus on cooking. Um, if cooking is fine, but shopping and budgeting are difficult, we would focus on those needs. Um, also, uh, just a general, you know, where, and, and this is the same for anybody, regardless of ability or disability, you know, where, where would you like to live? You know, do you want to live? Do you want to live down the street? Is it realistic to live down the street? Do you want to live across town? Do you want to live in another town? Do you, you know, do you want a one bedroom? Do you want a studio? Do you want a two bedroom? Do you want upstairs, downstairs? You know, general living questions like we all would have. You know, you kind of look and you're like, oh, wow, I like this neighborhood. But right now, that neighborhood's really expensive. So I don't think I can go straight to that neighborhood. But that can kind of be like the long term goal. So um, this you know, this apartment complex or this rental housing um, area is is feasible. So let's let's look there and let's talk to the landlords. What type of deposit is needed? What type of um, paperwork is needed to apply for it? Do you need do you need a bank account? 
okay, probably so. So we would need to go ahead and start a bank account for you. I apologize. The gardeners are right outside my window. So <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> Timing is everything. Um, <laughs> But um, so, you know, would, would you need to, would he need to start a bank account? And so, you know, we need to go ahead and start that before he can put together um, a deposit and checks and things of that nature or direct deposit to rent. Um, also, you know, what, what type of housekeeping skills um, <laughs> does he already have? Does he need, you know, I'm, I'm Leaning by the giggles yeah. of that. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> no, definitely not. Definitely so, not. So, <laughs> you know, what What can we do? Number one, why do we need to do housekeeping skills? What does it matter? Um, and number two, how? And how often? You know, you start out with, okay, you have to buy the cleaning supplies. I remember when I first moved out, this has nothing to do with a disability or not. It's just a newbie moving out. My family always had a huge drawer of rags. Yep. And I never thought anything of it. And then when I moved out, I thought, how do you get rags? Where do they come <laughs> from? You know, what do you do? And, you know, so I asked my family members and they were like, oh yeah, they're old towels that are old and we rip them up and use them for rags. And I said, well, I just bought my towels. They're not old yet. What do I do now? And I said, oh, well, you know, you can buy rags. Well, like, oh, okay, I'll go buy rags. So, but those are those little things that you don't think about until you move out and you don't have access to mom and dad or brother and sister or whomever, you know, their stock, if you will, you know, and, and you need to get your own. And you kind of think, well, yikes, where does that stuff come from? How, how do you get A, B, and C? Um, I, I was talking to a friend and she was helping her son learn how to do the laundry. And she realized that she never talked to him about cleaning out the lint trap in the dryer. And so he never would do it. And she was like, oh, you know, you got to clean this out because if you don't, this all gets really hot because the heater, the dryer heats up and it can catch on fire. So you need to take that stuff out of there and throw it away and then put it back in. And he said, oh, he said, I saw the little sign that says, you know, you have to clean the lint trap before each use. He said, but I never knew what the lint trap was. So it's those little tidbits that we kind of take for granted once we start doing them on our own that we just sort of never think about in teaching somebody who is new at it. Um, so what we can do is we can go step by step with those sorts of things um you okay. know, cleaning the bathrooms clean, you know cleaning out the refrigerator once or twice a year or however many times um you know what do you use to clean out the refrigerator it's different than what you use to clean your bathroom you know <laughs> those sorts of things yeah um, um and you guys are i mean you'll go all that in depth and go i mean because he will be 38 this year, um, but has never lived on his own, has never had to do a budget. My mom has pretty much taken care of him his entire life, but as they're aging, that yes. will fall then on my siblings and I, and my siblings and I um, are trying to find a way to help him become more independent, not mm -hmm. only for selfish reasons, but also because we want him to be able to have the kind of life that we've been able to live sure. and we think he's capable of doing that but has never had somebody push him to do so. Yes. Another thing that might be, might, might be um, a part of this conversation, at least with him, is maybe like a limited power of attorney or a medical power of attorney. So for things that are more serious, um, such as medical care or um, large financial purposes, um, things of that nature, you you can have limited powers of attorney. Um, you you don't have control over everything, or you can also have um, supported independence, which is basically you kind of have like a, a core core team of folks that may be an independent living center um, staff member. It may be a staff member from. Um, another agency such as um, 
Meridian Health Services or, or some other health, mental health services agencies, things of that nature. And, and for larger things, like if he wanted to buy a car or something, and you know that team would get together with him and say, you know, okay, this is what buying a car really means. It means this chunk of money goes away right now. And then every month, this chunk of money goes away. So, you know, that kind of, kind of more of a group approach to it versus a, um, uh, like flying by the seat of your pants <laughs> yeah like thing. the rest of us learn how to do it kind of <laughs> exactly exactly or a completely controlled environment which isn't isn't in his best interest either right so it's kind of a kind of a community group and it can be family members it doesn't have to be family members it can be a combination of both okay so okay. yeah thank you sure Any other thoughts or questions or positive stories about independence? Not all at once. <laughs> Anything more in chat? No. Um, Tamara, anything in the session Q and A? I posted those in the oh. um, the chat too. Oh, good. Okay, thank so you. So you might want to um, go. I think Elizabeth was here. Yes. Um, and Kathy, yeah. But mm -hmm. um, Chris, Crystal Baker. Um, yes. Posted one about Hancock County as well. Uh huh. So you might want to yep. go back to the Q and A and answer those. Sure, sure. Yep, I can definitely do that. And I'm trying to remember the name. Kathy, was it you that asked the question about the DSP? The, the becoming your daughter's DSP? I might be remembered. It was not me. It was not you. Okay, I'm sorry. No, no that's okay. That's, yeah, that's under somebody else's name. Okay. Um, that's well, not uh, listed here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, if, if that person watches this later, um, I'd be glad to talk with you about that. I do have a couple questions that I need to get a little bit more information about, um, in order to answer your question more effectively about becoming a DSP for your daughter and where to begin with that. Um, what, what I believe your question is, and like I said, I might be incorrect, so we, we would need to have a discussion. But um, just in general, what I, I think the question was or is, is for somebody who's becoming a direct service provider for their daughter, um, the first question I have is what services are you providing? Um, a direct service provider is more of an individual who does who does something like home health care for an individual or something of that nature. I have a feeling the person might be more thinking in the lines of a power of attorney for, for their daughter. Um, but once again, that's where clarification would come in. DSP may be something different than what I'm thinking of. Um, so, but it, if it is something in line, along the lines of a power of attorney, what I would recommend is you, you number one, research it, of course, no matter what I say, research it, <laughs> because there are always, there's always much more out there than I can remember and I can give you. And especially doing things with legal aspects. Um, I am not a lawyer. I don't play one on TV. I didn't stay at a holiday in last night. Um, uh, I, the only thing I know about the legal process and stuff that I've researched um, I do not have a background in law, um, but in terms of becoming a, a power of attorney for someone, I would look into the different types of powers of attorney 
Like I mentioned, you can be a medical power of attorney. You can be a complete power of attorney. Um, that there's there's different things that you can focus on or or be responsible for. Um, and then also, um, that would need to be something that would be filed with the courts. So you would need to get um, some sort of legal representation or legal support in order to file that paperwork. Um, and then you would go to your courts and file the actual paperwork to become a power of attorney if that's what the question is about. Um, it's a, if it's a, a home health care provider, um, then you, if, if you'd like to be paid for that, you can go through specific channels. Um, and, and there are certain cases that it can be covered under the waiver program. Once again, going back to if she's under a waiver, if, what waiver she's under, excuse me, those sorts of specifics. So um, to completely answer that question, I would really need more information, but um, that's just kind of a general thought on what I think the question might be asking. And then I think the other one, uh, what was the other question? <laughs> oh, from the board? Yes. Um, mostly about that. Um, oh, and about the after. What does after mean? Right. <laughs> what they meant by after it, the plan had changed from what they were talking about for after. Um, okay. Yeah. So I think it was um, a different topic from before, but I think um most people are, are looking at okay after uh they're not well they're no longer a child anymore that they need to we have you know family members who are now moving into a, an adult world and mm -hmm. so i think our after moved to that perspective okay um, yeah yeah so yeah what is what do supports look like after 18 or 22 or 24, um, depending on what uh, determination of adult you're viewing. <laughs> right. And that's, that's really where the independent living centers can come in and help bridge that gap. As I mentioned in the K through 12 realm, there, whether it's, whether it's been a good smooth road or not, there are lots of, of legal supports in place with special education, with IEPs, with um, uh, wraparound services for students, all of that sort, sort of stuff is in place. And then in the employment realm, you get ADA and 504 kicking in, in terms of providing accommodations, providing non-discrimination in the workplace, providing access, those sorts of things. But the in-between, the graduation before you go into work and after you get out of school, there, there's a little bit of a, a valley there. And that's where the independent living centers can come in and help with those core services of transition and independence and advocacy and peer support and information and referral. All those wrapped up together can really help solidify and smooth out that transition, or at least that's what our intentions are. And um, we, you know, we, the, the centers really, a lot of the centers focus on different things, um, but we all do those five core services. So we, that, that's, in a nutshell, that's why we're here, <laughs> um, is to help with those independent living skills, whether they start at two and, you're wanting to help your little one put on their shoes and socks, or if they're 35 and moving out of the, or 38 and moving out of the home, and what does that look like? If they're 18 and going to college out of state, what does that look like? You know, all the things in between, we're there for the gambit. We, we serve from birth to passing, any age, any disability. So, um, and like I said before, if we can't do it directly or if we can't do it 
if we're not the best program to do it in your county, then we can be a liaison to the program who would be the best to serve. I think that's about it. Let's see, about 10 minutes early, but <laughs> of, just just a little. Um, I'm what? sorry, I talk a little quickly, so. <laughs> I think we hit all their questions and topics. So great. Unless anyone has another question, we could be finished, I guess. Okay. Well, we can we can get out a little early. People can get, you know, snacks or restroom breaks before the next session. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. Alrighty. Yes, thank you all for joining. Thank oh, you. wait, there's a new message. Oh, oh. Uh, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Bye. Bye.